We have a very special guest with us today, Perry Quartusio. He's an upcoming junior at Montclair State University, and he's studying psychology and plans to eventually earn a graduate degree in sports psychology. Perry played baseball for 15 years and is, and is a former college athlete at Montclair State. He's also a mental skills coach for power pitching and hitting baseball in Plainsboro, New Jersey. Perry recently wrote a book and released an ebook on mental performance and sports psychology called Reaching Home Plate, which is now available in paperback on Amazon. He's also co-teaching a course on sports psychology at Montclair State. Thanks for being here, Perry. No, thank, thanks for having me, man. I appreciate you for having me on. Cool. I'm just going to jump right into the questions. And my first question is, I know you've done a lot of research about mental performance in sports. And one of the popular topics right now is athletes getting into the zone or into the flow. What does that mean? Yeah, so flow is a very hot topic right now. And I'm, you know, I'm learning more about it uh, you know, each day. Um, but everything that I've learned, uh, I, I got from Dr. Sue Jackson, uh, who I've heard speak on the High Performance Mindset podcast, and that's hosted by Sin, uh, Dr. Sinja Kampoff. So I give complete credit to Dr. Sue Jackson and complete credit to Dr. Sinja Kampoff for having this podcast and talking about flow because I got a lot of notes and um, a lot of things out of uh, out of that podcast for, about this topic. So. So flow is like, you know, when you're really and totally engaged in a task, um, it's, you know, you're having a lot of fun. It's associated, it's associated like with your best levels of performance and, you know, your most enjoyable experiences. Like you can have flow, you know, reading, you can have flow doing a sport, you can have flow doing anything. Um, and, and flow is like, a, just a, it's just a different state of, you know, awareness and consciousness. Uh, you have a heightened awareness. Um, it's like, why do you do what you do? You know, so like you can perform poorly even when you're in flow. Um, so I think it's just so important to be in flow. Um, but the, the biggest part with flow is like you have to find an activity that you're going to enjoy because when you're enjoying an activity, uh, you're going to you're just going to tap into flow naturally. And it's like you're already already immersed into the situation. You're fully present. It's not really hard to concentrate or lose your focus, if that makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. And do you have any tips on how to get into the flow? Is it a trainable thing? Yeah, so uh, I remember Dr. Sue Jackson making it a point to say, you know, don't force flow, but you can definitely, you know, you can definitely train things and, and tap into your your experiences and be aware of your senses. So tapping into your senses can all be done by like, you know, doing training of, you know, mindfulness. That's a good way to tap into the flow, but not forcing it. That happens, you know, naturally. Um and just your, you know, your focus of attention. How can we get back to the present moment? And that starts with awareness. And a big thing with awareness is, you know, noticing and doing things without judgment, just seeing things uh, as they are. So, you know, a quick mindfulness practice. Um, so you first have to develop your breathing. So you just focus on your breath for, you know, about a minute or two, and you just pay attention to things. You have no distractions. Um, fade away the, the, the incoming thoughts that are creeping into your head. And you just learn the skill of being, you know, breathing and being and being able to apply it uh, to situations where you need it most. And that's where that those are the high pr pressure situations. Um, and that's something you have to practice. You have to practice, you know, being in high pressure situations, uh, practice being stressful. Um, you know, it sounds so weird to practice being stressful, but stress is you know, it's not necessarily a good thing. And, and flow is a good reminder of that. Being in flow is a good reminder of that. So what are the biggest benefits of the state of flow? Ooh, the biggest benefits of state of flow. Uh, I just think, you know, when you're, when you're in flow, you, you just kind of stop worrying about yourself. You, the ego's out the door and you're seeing things as they are, as I mentioned before. You know, you're, you're not, you know, nothing else matters, but you know, the present moment, you're living life fully in that moment. So that helps with, you know, not just sport, but really anything in life, you have a, a hard test or a hard exam or a quiz coming up, right? Like you have to study for it, people get stressed and anxious and nervous. And they're like, Oh, my gosh, am I gonna? Am I gonna do well on this? Um, but when you have flow, when you're training, and you're, you're focusing on your breathing, all that fades away, all that goes away. So I think that's really important. I think that's one of the great benefits of it. And again, just having fun is a benefit from it. And that's, that's a, that's a pre predecessor of, of, 
of flow. You have to have fun while you know doing the activity and fully immerse yourself in the present. I hope that makes sense um, to your listeners and to yourself. Yeah, that makes sense. And do you have any like athletes that you know or famous athletes that talk about flow and how they get into it and all that good stuff? Um, I, so I don't know any, you know, personally, I don't know any athletes that talk about flow. Um, I, I think of one example that I always bring up, um, with, with flow or even this presence is, uh, I got this from, you know, one of my mentors, Brian Miles, he's the, um, not the performance coordinator with the Cleveland Indians. And he, he's, he brought up this great point of Tom Brady, right? So say Tom Brady is down a score or two in the fourth quarter and you see Tom Brady just go down the field. Like, how does he remain so calm and poised? Like, how is he so clutch, right? Um, and those elite performers, are, they, they win. The acronym is WIN. They, they focus on what is important now. What's important now? Win, right? So that's not dwelling on the past or worrying about the future. And elite performers are fully immersed in the present moment. So they're experiencing flow, executing one task at a time. You know, the best of the best are experiencing flow. They're present. They focus on what they can control and attack each moment. And that, they attack each moment one moment at a time, one play at a time. And that's the, you know, the biggest advantage um, when you're, you know, when you're trying to be clutch or your you know if that makes sense yeah and i'm sure like many of these athletes go into the flow zone a lot and do you think because of that flow zone that's why they're so successful I'm, i think there's a lot of variables that make a, an elite athlete successful but i think it's definitely a factor for sure um i don't know if i could if i could just say yeah you have a lot of flow and you're going to be a really great athlete uh i wouldn't go that far but Elite athletes, um, I think elite athletes um, have the most flow when they're when they're you know in clutch situations or high pressure situations. That's when it's seen the most. But again, there's a lot of variables that go into that. So uh, I wouldn't just say it's flow that make them the most successful, but it's definitely a factor. So what are some other factors that you think are really important? Maybe it's like mental techniques that they use. Yeah. Yeah. Um, if we're just talking about the mental game, uh, you know, and leave aside the physical training that they do, um, a really important thing is to, you know, physical training can be, is training, right? And mental training is training. So are they, you know, I used to think that sports psychology and mental performance was just, you know, psyching yourself up, hyping yourself up, listening to, you know, a, a hype song before a game or a pregame or pre-practice and, and you're, you're getting in the zone, you're mentally tough. I used to think that's what it is, but mental performance is strength conditioning for your mind, right? So you have to train your mind the same way you train your body. So training your mind is, you know, that's, that's breathing. You're focusing on your breathing and tapping into your, your senses, right? You're, you're aware of your experiences. That, that's, that's a whole, uh, a big part of it. Uh, you could do imagery and visualization techniques, that's another uh, crucial skill. Uh, you can you know do things to to build you know confidence and positivity. Um, there's there's uh, that's a, there's a ton of things that you could bring into uh, performance and increasing enhancing your performance. So uh, definitely mental techniques uh, help. And I would say the elite athletes, the elite performers, the best of the best, definitely do and focus on mental training more than the average high schooler college athlete uh, might yeah i agree and um moving on to your book uh reaching home plate you talk yeah. about getting recruited overcoming challenges and achieving mastery um what made you decide to write the book Ooh, so i i actually get this question a lot um so I, i'll tell i'll tell a quick story so i was in um so I was my sophomore year of college. I was in my, uh, this sport psychology class, psychology of sport. Uh, and I had this professor, Dr. Gilbert, uh, one of the best professors that I've ever had and I might know. Um, he is the best. So he, uh, we were in class, the first day of class, um, you know, it's 8.30 class, you know, I'm, I'm half awake. And 
I have baseball practice later, and I'm, like, just thinking about it. And this guy says, this guy has the audacity to say, right? He says, I'm going to get you guys to write a book or break a world record. He says that in the first class. And I'm like, what is this guy talking about? This guy's nuts. And, like, every single class after, he would just bring it up. And I'm like, dude, I'm not writing a book. I'm 19. I'm 20 now. But I'm 19 years old. I'm not writing a book. Like, I'm not doing that. Sorry. And every day he would just bring out the benefits of writing a book or breaking a world record and setting yourself apart. So it was September when I had the idea of the book. Maybe I could, maybe I could do this thing. Um, so my three topics that I wanted to do were just recruiting, uh, overcoming adversity and just achieving mastery and just like your regular advice, general advice. And I wrote maybe four pages. I reached out to maybe 10 people and I gave up um, and I put away the document. I was like, okay, I'm not doing this. This is, this is dumb. And months later, COVID, you know, COVID hit and I had a lot of free time on my hands. This, at this time, I, I wasn't playing baseball anymore. I decided not to try out for the team again. And, you know, it was a rough time for me. It was a hard time in my life. And I was like, what do I do with myself? Um, so that's when I opened up the book document again, and that's when I reached out to, you know, a bunch of, a bunch of professionals in baseball and, you know, college players, college coaches, professional players, professional coaches in hitting, pitching, fielding, you name it, um, and, and started writing. And after that, I just, I, uh, I went full force. I had this fire and next thing you know, I, uh, released a book and it was, it was the best thing that could ever happen to me. So. So who was your target audience? Was it like for high school athletes? Yeah, so um, I would say my target audience is probably anybody less than pro professional baseball. Um, I'm not saying, you know, professional baseball players, you know, if they read my book, I don't think they would not benefit from it. But I think the most benefit would be from the high school, the college athletes, the youth, uh, youth athletes too. Um, so anywhere from, you know, 12U all throughout high school and definitely college would find my book very beneficial. So since you wrote the book, um, what were some of the parts that you think you could talk about that were super beneficial and you think that's really important? Oh, wow. Um, yeah, so I, I ha in my book is, um, I think, almost every topic that you could think of in baseball other than um, maybe base running I didn't, I didn't add in there, but like from hitting, pitching, fielding, catching, outfield, uh, strength training and, you know, mobility, recovery, nutrition, sleep, uh, and then the mental side of the game uh, are all in the, you know, topics that are talked about. And I, I acknowledge that, you know, I have a lot of contributions in the book. Like I obviously put my, I share my personal experiences and insights and, you know, everything that I learned as a baseball player. Uh, you know, most of my book is contributions from professionals, from other people. And I thought that was important to you know gather information from other great coaches and hear other perspectives from college and minor league players for other people to listen to hear and listen to and read about um so if you have any question regarding any of those topics definitely um, it definitely fits for you I, I think my favorite were obviously um mental performance and sports psychology that was my one of my favorites uh to write and then um and then pitching because I, I was just you know i was a pitcher and i made sure um, that I got the right guys to be in the book. So did you talk about getting in the zone in your book as well? No, I, I actually didn't. So, um, so I, I have a, you know, a small section on presence that I talked about previously and earlier, but, you know, I really didn't understand or learn any of that, you know, flow stuff or getting in the zone until after the release of my book, which is like, you know, sad because I learned so much more um, on the field that I wish I could just like write my book over again and put that information in. Um, and that's, that's why I had my, uh, that's why I made the Google Drive because I wish I could have put all that information into the book, but uh, I just didn't after the release, so. That's great. Would you mind talking about the Google Drive? Yeah, so um, it was a couple uh, weeks after the release of Reaching Home Plate, I, um, I wanted to do something else because like I was so on fire with the book. Like I just wanted to do more things and 
Uh, so what I decided to do was uh, listen and uh, listen to all these podcasts that I thought were helpful, and I would take notes on every single podcast I listen to. I take notes of. Um, so I and then books I read. I, I you know I I'm making notes while I'm reading them with a pencil, and I'm just writing them into a document. And I have videos and all these you know tweets, and I put into this document pictures. Um, other podcasts, right? So I just put everything I learn. I take notes, I put it into a document, and I put it into the Google Drive. And the Google Drive is like, you know, growing every single day. And I, I share it with everybody that I can because I think it's super beneficial, not just for, um, for athletes, but for just regular people, um, for general well being. Um, so I, I highly recommend for anybody to check it out because I think it's awesome. And if for, so what the drive does is it forces me to learn more about mental performance in the field. And then also it's just, um, I think it's just a great resource to have all these documents into one place. So that was my goal of it. And my goal is to get in every single one, every single person on this planet, you know, I want it on their computer because it's awesome. I see. I checked it out and there's so much information and advice on there and I'll definitely link it below on my website. Thank you. Um, so I know you have a website with a blog as well, and I know you discussed parents who push their kids in sports. Is this a common problem today in sports, or is it good that parents push their kids? Yeah, so um, this is something you know I I kind of addressed in the beginning of my book, and I I put that you know less youths play sports and they quit so early because of the pressure that their parents put on them. You know, I see it firsthand. Um, so I'm an assistant coach, and I'm also like a mental performance coach with an academy program uh, here in Jersey. And I see, or I talk to kids even, and they always just press, right? They play so tight because they're either trying to impress their parents, uh, they're just trying to impress or impress their parents instead of having fun and actually enjoying the game. Um, and and it's sad to see youths quit because of that reason. And I, you know. Um, when you get to the high school level or even the college there, there's a ton of other challenges, you know, that student athletes face. Um, I don't know if you want to talk about that at all, but there's just so many other challenges and, um, it's sad to see, I like, you know, being hard on your kids or, you know, helping them, trying to push them sometimes is harmful. So I, I think there's a, um, a fine line between, you know, criticism and just, you know, constructive feedback, right? I think there's a fine line between that. And I think sometimes parents cross it without knowing and thinking that they're helping, but they're not. So what is some advice for those athletes that play tight and because of their parents' pressures? I mean, my advice would only just to be, I, I, man, I had this one kid come up to me and he was like, how do I get my parents out of my head? Every time I swing a bat, in the batter's box, I look behind me and see my dad like shaking his head. And I, like that kind of like broke my heart. I was like, dude, you can't let your, you know, you can't let your dad get in the head. And it's obviously easier said than done. Um, but during competition, you know, even when you see your fan, your, your friends in the stands or other fans, like it could affect an, you know, an athlete's ability to perform at, at their best level. Um, so the number one thing, whether you're youth or professional or college, high school athlete, whatever, the number one thing is you need to just control what you control. And that's such a, that's such a, uh, what's the word? I mean, cliche, it's such a cliche uh, saying, but you know, what's in your control, your effort, your attitude, and your focus, you can't let, you know, your parents get in your head. And again, it's so much easier said than done. And I wish I had like a, a definitive answer for that because it's, it's sad seeing youths quit. Um, and in college, like it's even college athletes have the same problem with their parents. Like in college and in high school, you have everyday challenges too. Now you have your, you have to worry about your grades, you know, your, your relationships with your boyfriend or girlfriend, or you have family issues or, you know, anything that takes an athlete, uh, you know, whatever takes them out of their head and loses focus like that affects them um, mentally, physically on the field, off the field. So effort, attitude, focus, focus on what you can control. And uh, that's the best I have because I wish I had the answer for that. That's great advice. And have you, I'm just wondering if you've dealt with that pressure from your parents or friends personally. And I want to see like 
how you dealt with that um, stress and all that. Yeah, so um, I had a little bit of pressure um, from my dad, but uh, it didn't get so bad where I, you know, I wanted to quit. It just, it was me. Uh, it was, we kind of picked up on it early. And it, so sometimes we, we kind of had like a compromise where um, if I was pitching or playing, he wouldn't be like in direct sight of me. Because if I saw him, then I would do bad, right? Because I was thinking um, just, oh, man, like, I need to I need to do this. I need to impress. Um, but when he was not in sight, but he was still there, I, you know, I performed better. Uh, so we had that little compromise. And um, I thank my dad, you know, for that compromise. And uh, so I definitely had that experience. Friends, I wouldn't say I had uh, experiences with that issue. Um, but I, I, you know, that, was, that happened when I was younger. So, and obviously when I got older... I didn't let him get my head, obviously, and um, I just played my game. I focused on what I could control. That's great. And, yeah, just talking to your parents and just, like, dealing it out with them, I think that's the best way to go. Um, Do you think that, like, people that you've worked with that are pressured by their parents, do you think that stops them from getting into the zone since that's, like, our main focus of this podcast? Yeah, 100%. Uh, you know, as I mentioned before, and what Dr. Sue Jackson said is like, you need to be enjoying the, you need to be enjoying the task. How could you enjoy, you know, playing or performing when you're pressing because of your parents? You can't. It's, it's not, you know, having fun's not on the forefront of your, of your mind. It's impressing your parents or making sure you do good because of your, you know, your parents are watching. Um, so yeah, it definitely hinders their ability to get in the zone and, and experience flow that we were talking about. I see. And on your website, you like talk about the books you've been reading or what you have read. Um, Do you have any recommendations for younger athletes that you think are great? Uh, Yeah. So, I mean, I, I didn't start reading, reading. Like I, I got, I I always, I always recommend books to younger people, you know, younger kids. And I don't know if you actually read them or not. um, Because I, you know, I didn't read read for leisure when I was younger and I don't expect other kids to, but I would definitely recommend, um, maybe not a younger kid, maybe like around high school age, I would recommend, uh, mindset by Carol Dweck. Um, and that's, you know, that's a topic that we could talk about another day is she explains, you know, what, you know, the differences between the growth mindset versus a fixed mindset. And it's just a foundation for everything that I'm, I, I like learning about is, you know, the growth mindset is viewing failures and challenges as opportunities. You know, you're always open to learning and trying new things and being able to, you know, get feedback and view it as helpful instead of hurtful or an attack. And then fixed mindset is, you know, the complete opposite, very limiting mindset. Uh, you see failures as, you know, the end of your capabilities. You're saying like, like, oh, I, I, I'm not good at this. Like, I'm just not going to do this. Um, because I'm bad at it. Um, people with a fixed mindset or, you know, they don't like challenges. They hate being uncomfortable. Like they despise it, uh, because they don't, again, they don't like criticism or feedback because they take those things very personal. So I think that's one book that I would recommend. And then I would recommend just, um, a couple podcasts actually, because podcasts are easier to listen to. You don't have to, you know, read words on a page Mm -hmm. because no one does that anymore. Um, but some podcasts to listen to, definitely, I can name a bunch, but off the top of my head, uh, and the Increase Your Impact podcast by Justin Sua. He is the uh, mental performance coach for the Tampa Bay Rays. Um, then there is a podcast I love, uh, The High Performance Mindset with Dr. Sindra Kampoff. Um, the Mind Leads Performance podcast with uh, John Gold and Andy Harris. Um, I'm missing one. Uh, Finding Mastery with Dr. Michael Gervais. He's awesome. Uh, what else am I missing? The 1% Better Podcast by Joe Ferraro. I'm, I'm sorry. I'm just like listing off these podcasts. Um, oh, and then there's a uh, success hotline. I don't know if you want to talk about that, but Dr. Gobert's success hotline, my professor, he has a success hotline. It's uh, I give the phone number um, 973-743. Four six nine zero, and that you know that's two to three minutes every day of just straight motivation and mindset help. Um, 
So all those things I definitely recommend. Uh, if you want to link all of them or any of them. Yeah, I will. Be, yeah. So was that success hotline? Like, do you just call that number and then you're on the phone with your professor? Oh, no. So he leaves a message. You call the number and there's a, this a message uh, waiting for you to listen to. Um, he, he, I, I forget the number, but he's been doing it every day for like at least a decade, I think. Like I got, it's for, he's like years, years, oh, wow. a lot of years. Yeah. He, every day he, he does it. It doesn't matter if he's sick. doesn't matter. Uh, he always puts it up in early in the morning and, um, or late at night and he's there to listen to. Have you found like motivation and perseverance from all that advice from him? <laughs> yeah. I mean, just having him in class was, um, a privilege. Uh, and you just feed off of his energy and like, he yeah, like, I don't know how he got me to write a book. Like it was just a regular college kid and I just, um, college student athlete, uh, writing a book. Like it just, it seems so far fetched and he made it seem not so far fetched. He ma- he makes things seem not impossible, but definitely possible. Um, so just being in his class and again, listen to the hotline, uh, helped me a lot with my motivation and perseverance. Yeah. I see. And um, as a former athlete, what do you wish you heard or knew about that could have helped you perform or mentally um, in the long run? I, I think everything. My, my answer to that is everything. Um, like I said before, like, I didn't know anything about sports psychology when I was playing. Like, I, I understand the importance of the mental game, but like, I didn't know how to train it. Right. I didn't know. um what any of the, those terms meant. Like, I just wish I could, I mean, I always think about it now, like when I'm coaching, I wish I could play now because I know, I, I wish, you know, I know, now I know things that I wish I knew, right? So uh, I wish I knew everything. Uh, I think in, spe- in specific, like definitely the breathing, um, the breathing techniques that I've learned, definitely, because um, I do them now when I'm just doing regular regular task whenever I'm, I feel stressed or anxious, but I can't even imagine what that would have done for my performance if, if I was stressful on the mound pitching, right? I, I don't know. Um, would I still be playing? Again, I don't, I don't know. Uh, I wish, so I wish I knew everything for sure. Cool. Would you mind speaking a little bit about the, your breathing technique? Yeah, so um, there's, this, there's a bunch of breathing techniques that you could do. Um, the, the common one is the, the, the box breathing, so four square breathing. You inhale through your nose for four seconds, right? And then you exhale for four seconds. Um, I'm trying to think what other I do. Oh, I, so the another one I do is four, seven, eight breathing is when you inhale through your nose for four seconds and then you hold that, hold that uh, breath deep in your diaphragm. Um, and you fill it, you fill it up in your belly, you feel it, uh, and you hold that breath for seven seconds. Um, and then you exhale for eight seconds and you really focus on that exhale. Cool. Thank you for that advice. And yeah, yeah. you and I both understand how important it is to develop mental skills when playing sports, but most people don't. So how do you propose that we make people aware of this important topic so that it becomes widespread knowledge? Yeah. I mean, so that's something that I, I wanted to do, and I, I hope to accomplish with the, the Google Drive folder that I share. Uh, so in in terms of you know making people aware of this topic, um, I, I think taking advantage of social media. Is. Is key because the cool thing about like mental performance and sports psychology, right? Uh, the field is so open and caring. Um, like every professional that I've talked to is so open to share insights, give feedback. Um, like in the sports psychology field, we're all on the same side and it's really awesome. So to make it, you know, um, widespread, like we should all collaborate together and try to make it wide, as widespread as possible for other, for other people to, to know about. Um, it's, a, it is a growing field now. And that's awesome because, um, you see, you see that like baseball has a lot now because I, I don't know, in the past couple of years, um, they didn't have any. Now they have, I think, 28 out of the 30 baseball teams in the MLB have a team, a, a staff of mental performance coaches, sports psychology consultants. And that's awesome because every sport needs that. Um, 
every person needs peak performance techniques and ide- and and ideas mindset training like it's all it's not just sports psychology it's it's peak performance it's peak psychology it's it's performance psychology like you need that in real life you need that in um in your everyday jobs and school so i i think social media is a big part of that and i try my best to um put content out and share as much as i can um for those who don't know me um so i, I think i think that's that's cool using social media because social everyone on social media right so let's let's bring this topic into social media let's let's blow this topic up because it's uh the sport whole thing with sports psychology is it's uh behind the scenes like you always see the home runs and the the championships you you always see the trophies right but no one sees the um the training that goes on behind that the mm-hmm. physical training sometimes we see but when do we ever hear people talk about breathing and visualization it's getting out a lot more now which is really cool um but when do you really ever hear about it not not really not that often so um maybe having professional athletes talk about it more other people talk about it more um but again i think social media could be a real big part of it and i hope my my folder does that in some extent yeah that's great um well that's all my questions do you have anything else you want to add to anything um i just just have one piece of advice for for maybe you or anybody listening here uh if they want to do something right they want to accomplish something um my my biggest advice best advice that i could give is to just do it like just do it um you could read all the books in the world you can take all the classes you want you can listen to everything you want to but knowledge needs to be applied i think there's this what's the equation knowledge plus application equals power right so it's cool to know every it's cool to know a lot of things but when you start to apply what you know you learn so much more that's that's what you know that's you learn through experiences um so if something's holding you back and you're thinking about not doing it i don't care just do it um you learn more you learn from your failures you learn from the setbacks it's okay because it's expected but just do it because if you don't, you know, if you don't do it, then you're going to regret it. Right. Um, and the pain, the, the short term pain, maybe now is far, far less of the pain than of the pain of regret. So just do it, do things now, get things done and just take action, take action, take action, take action every single day. Um, that's, that's the best a piece of advice I can give, whether you're want to be a doctor, you want to be a sports psychology coach, you want to be a teacher, any anything in the world, you want to be an astronaut. Like there's again, Lauren Johnson said this best. She's a New York Yankees um, mental performance coach. She said, "There's no such thing as an accidental astro- astronaut. Like there isn't. Like you have to put in the work. You you put in consistent effort and you take action. That's how you that's how you do it. That's a simple answer to." Uh, to achieving your goals yeah that's great guidance and i totally agree um well i'm gonna link your instagram and twitter down below because it says because you have so much resources that i think would be good for everybody to see and i also link your google drive with, where you talk about some an example stuff that you posted is how to handle nervousness and aaron judges mistake routine and i'll post that all thanks again for being here cool uh, yeah sounds good and and thank you for having me on i really appreciate it yeah of course i i know we'll uh i know we'll talk off camera and off the podcast and uh i'm excited to see what you do in the future i'm excited to do uh, excited to see you in the sports psychology world because it's a great one uh, i'm excited to see you mm-hmm. in it i love what you're doing